All right, thank you very much. Um, and good morning, afternoon or evening to you, wherever you happen to be. Uh, th this is a, essentially a technical subject that we're going to try and present in a non-technical way so that you get some idea. Um, I see we've got a Mr. McCool. Could I ask you to turn your video off, please? Just to keep our bandwidth down. Uh, and I, I leave plenty of time at the end of the presentation for questions, but hopefully it shouldn't be too difficult to follow. Right. So before we begin, uh, I those of you who are not members of the Pipeline Industries Guild, this presentation is being made on behalf of the onshore panel. It's the panel that deals with all aspects of onshore pipelines. And I just wanted to let you know that the slides are a little bit more wordy than usual because I'm aware of the fact that they, they will be read by people who haven't attended the presentation and the presentation can be downloaded from the Guild website. Uh, just starting off with a, a couple of pictures that have been kindly sent to me by Elgin Energy, a company that specializes in, uh, in these large scale photovoltaic systems. And you'll see the extent of these. You can see the AC cables uh, going out there and these are the fields with the solar arrays here and here and uh, this is the the processing area and there you get a, another picture of these other remote sites as well so that they can be quite extensive it's not just um, a few panels on a roof and uh, that's just a little bit about about me i've been representing the pipeline industries guild on the national and international and European technical committees for cathodic protection and stray currents and coatings since 2003. And my co-author Richard Lindley has been involved in pipelines onshore and offshore for more than 20 years. And we've had special contributions from Professor Haralambus from the University of Cyprus and Dr. Thomas Luthner from Ecotech. So, few interesting facts before we kick off. Uh, this one always uh, takes people by surprise, but it's true. Every two minutes, the energy reaching the earth from the sun is equivalent to the complete annual energy uses of humanity. That's um, quite staggering. And that shows why we have the increase in, in solar systems. And the other staggering fact is, is 2.5 trillion US dollars is the estimated global annual cost of corrosion. And it's been estimated about 80% of that could be avoided. So what we're going to do today is to, to give you some idea of, of what external corrosion is on. Thank you. We're just going to give you some idea of um, what corrosion is on buried pipelines because you have to understand that before you can understand what the effects of the photovoltaic systems are um, and um, i'm then going to tell you a little bit how to prevent the problem of stray currents so i'm going to explain to you why stray currents are important to us and i'm going to do it without any uh, assuming any electrical or electrochemical knowledge. If you do have electrical or electrochemical knowledge, don't be uh, offended by how I've simplified it. What, I, what I'm trying to get over is, is the concept of what's happening. Right, photovoltaic systems, even in a country like the UK, where you hardly ever see the sun, are becoming more and more common and it's uh, could you 
put your video off, please, Mr. Lucas. Thank you. Uh, the PV systems are becoming more widespread for two reasons, really. One is they're becoming much more efficient. The actual panels themselves are much more clever than they ever used to be. And it's an attractive thing for many parts of the country with the carbon footprint that's always in everybody's mind. But there's also a financial return, which is attractive. So you, you, when you combine those two things, uh, it's no surprise that we're getting more and more people who are interested in these things. So the first part I'm going to explain to you is why pipelines corrode anyway. And it, it's all to do with the conservation of energy. Because steel doesn't actually want to be steel. It, it wants to be this, this amorphous blob of mud and ore that's its stable state. And if you think about the energy you have to expend to drag it out of the ground by mining and then subject it to very high temperatures and then make a pipe. And then you, as soon as you do that, once you bury it or, or put it in water, it starts to go back to where it wants to be. And if you leave it long enough, that steel will eventually go back to being what it was, its, its stable state. Luckily, that's a fairly slow process if um, all conditions are good. So there's a relationship between erosion and current. And there's, there's a law, which I'm not going to write out in full for you, but it tells us that if one amp DC leaves a piece of soil, steel in soil, you lose approximately 9.1 kilos of steel. And that, that's not an option, that, that's a, a law. And that's why we get very worried about erosion on pipelines because they're usually coated and if the steel that's exposed to this current that's leaving it is of a small surface area then that 9.1 kilos will easily represent the wall being totally consumed and if you just look at a piece of steel in the soil on its own the currents you're talking about are in microamps, 0.0001, as I put there. But on the other hand, if you look at a, a typical metro like the London Underground, each train could draw several thousand amps. And if you've got two trains at the same time, one on the up line, one on the down line, you could have 4,000 amps flying around. And if all of that current enters your pipe, which it can under certain fault conditions, then it has to leave the pipe at some stage and where it does, the metal will be consumed. And for the purposes of understanding this, it's more or less linear. Uh, I can't do the calculation in my head, but if one amp DC for one year results in 9.1 kilos of steel, then 4,000 amps for 20 seconds every hour is going to result in a, a substantial amount of uh, metal loss. And uh, that's just to prove to you that it is a, a linear relationship uh, in terms of current and uh, metal loss. So what the, what the coatings do then, that, that's the first thing you might ask. Well, coatings provide a, a high resistance to reduce the current that flows onto the soil. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll show you this relationship a bit more. But for buried pipelines, which is what we're really concerned with here, the coating is the primary source of external corrosion protection. And it used to be true that you couldn't get a perfect coating. But modern coatings and modern quality control systems are so good that you can get almost perfect coatings and you certainly can get perfect coatings over short distances which you, you never could in the past and we have standards that tell us about the coatings how they should be applied what they should be done how they should be uh, 
selected and we have certification for the people who undertake the coating application. And, and what a very important point is, is that if the stray current doesn't enter the pipe, that it cannot leave and hence cause corrosion. And it's insightful phrases like this that allow CP guys to charge such high fees. Uh, an acceptable corrosion rate limit is actually provided in the standards and it's generally reckoned that 10 thousandths of a meter per year is considered to be negligible. So cathodic protection, on the other hand, isn't a passive system like a coating, it's, um, it's an active system. And it's a, an electrochemical technique that forces current onto the pipeline to prevent current leaving the pipeline. And it, the analogy between electric current and water is often made, and it's not always useful. But in this case, if you imagine that you had a force of, um, forget about the units, but a force of 20 flowing through a, a pipe, and then if you then force that against 10 going in the other direction, you get a net amount of 10 going in the opposite direction. So if you get two forces meeting head on, the bigger force will push the smaller force. Well, that's a pretty good image about how CP works. You can think that if the current is forced onto the pipe, is greater than the current that's trying to leave, then there won't be any current leaving the pipe. Uh, the analogy works insofar as if you have a pipe that's very well coated with very few coating defects, you need very little current. Thousands of an amp will protect kilometers. But if you've got some poor old pipe that's been in the ground for about 60 or 70 years and the original coating has pretty well had it, you will need a lot of current to protect that. Sometimes it's not even possible to get enough current on economically to stop the corrosion. But theoretically, you, you, can, you can do that. And of course, there are many bare structures that are protected with cathodic protection, typically offshore structures. Not many of those um, are coated. So now here's the key technical blurb. This is the only formula that we're really going to look at today and it's called Ohm's Law and it tells us the relationship between electrical current, voltage and resistance. And for those of you without an electrical background and who've forgotten their high school physics, the voltage is basically the force that pushes the current around the electrical circuit and the resistance is everything that opposes that pushing. And what comes out of that is the current. So you can see that if the voltage is constant, if we increase this resistance here, then that will decrease. And similarly, if there are any changes in the voltage, you get an increase or decrease in the amount of current. And that is why the coatings work, because it increases this value of resistance and modern coatings are so good that they hardly change their characteristics throughout their entire design life. So just to summarize all that, corrosion of the pipe, in this example that we're thinking of, is associated with current leaving the pipe. And if there's no electrical interference from other sources, then the corrosion current would be less than a millionth of an ampere. The metal loss is directly proportional to how much current leaves and you can control the current by reducing the voltage or increasing the resistance in the circuit. That's really all you need to know. So now we're going to look at what a PV system comprises. PV is short for photovoltaic and you can see that you start business end with collecting the energy from the sun and those panels change that direct radiation into electric 
direct current. And that goes into a junction box and it then goes into a charger. And it then charges batteries in the same way that um, your ordinary car charger charges a battery. And then when we get to this point, we have to do a bit of electrical jiggery pokery to convert it from direct current to alternating current because all of our domestic dwellings and factories work on alternating current at 240 volts, 50 hertz, 50 cycles a second in the UK and 60 hertz, 60 cycles per second in the USA. And then it goes either to a consumer or, or to a national distribution grid. So you might say, well, what's the problem? How, how can it possibly affect a, a very pipeline? And the, the problem can be summed up as saying it's the current that gets into the earth that causes the problem. If the current only flowed, flowed through the cables as intended, then there wouldn't be a problem. But as we'll see a bit later on, the current does actually leave the, or can actually leave the cables through the insulation over a period of time. And also, all of these solar panels are fixed into a metal frame of some sort. And that metal frame stands on a metal leg. And that metal leg is connected to the ground. And for safety purposes, they're sometimes earthed as well. So if you think of how many solar panels there were in that first picture, if each one is leaking a little bit, you're going to get quite a bit of current leaking into the ground. Now, when current gets into the ground, it has to go back to its source. If you think of a very simple example, if you had a battery and a flashlight and you connected one cable to the positive side of the battery and one cable to the negative side of the battery and then you connected the flashlight bulb to the positive and negative, the bulb would light up and that circuit would be complete. The flow would be from the battery into the bulb, through the bulb, back through the cable and back into the battery. The moment you break that circuit by disconnecting one of the cables or operating a switch, the light will go out. So you always need a complete circuit. And you'll see in one of the next slides how the stray current completes the circuit because when the electricity gets into the ground, it has to get back to its source in order for the circuit to be complete. Electrons don't like just hanging around, they have to go somewhere and they go back to their source. And it's a sad fact that electric current, we often use the analogy which I mentioned earlier of water and current being the same and people will tell you that, that water flows, um, flows downhill and uh, therefore the bigger the voltage gradient, the, the more will go and so on and so forth. In actual fact, current flows everywhere. It doesn't just follow the lowest resistance, it follows every resistance path to get back. The amount that goes through each path varies. That's the difference. So we're just going to look at um, the problem a little bit more. Here you can see a, a schematic showing the the actual panels themselves, and they, they go through um, a collection system into a, a DC box, and they go into this widget here, which is called an inverter, which converts the DC to AC. And here you can see where the isolation resistance is, the, the resistance between a part of the construction and the earth. And this is the bit we need to be as high as possible to reduce the current. But we know that the main sources of MOS are in these three areas. One is in the module itself, one is in the cable insulation, and the other is in the inverter. And the, the actual um, ground fault conditions are what causes the problem in that 
they're set up to suit the operation of the solar farm. They're not set up for the convenience of the CP people. Here you can see it laid out in a slightly different format to give you an idea of what's happening. Here you've got the cells, the solar panels on, on their steel frameworks connected into collectors or junction boxes, into inverters, and then drifting off. And there's usually an earthing system around it, schematically shown by this red dotted line. And here you've got our, our poor old pipe. And because this current needs to get back to its source, if there's a coating defect on the pipe, that low resistance path of the pipe will allow it to conduct through the pipe and then jump back off. If the pipe was perfectly insulated, it wouldn't pick up anything at all. Now, th there are three types of, um, three basic types of system earthing which affect us. One is the earth photovoltaic system, which is this one, which I'll go through in a moment. There's another one which is called floating, which means that the earth of the photovoltaic system isn't connected to the safety earth. And there's a third system, which is a floating system, which is non-isolated. But here you can see quite graphically how the current jumps on the pipe and there's no problem where it jumps on. The problem is where it jumps off because here it's jumping off to go back to the earth to complete the circuit. And where that leaves, Faraday's law will kick in and give you 9.1 kilos per amp per year. So you've either got to reduce this to a very low value so that the corrosion rate's insignificant. But the ground fault detection is determined by these primary standards here, the, the uh, UL and the IEC standards. But as you can see, if it's greater than 250 kilowatts, which most of these industrial ones are bound to be, uh, you could have a threshold of five amps. So anything below five amps would still be getting into your pipe, which is undesirable for us. So we would only have uh, a couple of remedies here. You'd have to significantly beef up your CP system to take care of the five amps trying to leave here. But by far the best method is, is to, for long term, is to repair the coating to make sure that there are no discharge paths. But of course, if this happens to be a 15 kilometer transverse, it's hugely expensive to dig up. That's only a viable option during initial construction or if you've just got one or two small areas to repair. This is the isolated system. It has a different earthing. Here you can see the earthing, but the current isn't returning to that because it's isolated. So it's returning via the cable because the, the cable insulation is not always very good, especially if there have been some cost savings um, applied and very cheap insulation, maybe single insulated cable is used or if the cable is just laid in, in the wet ground, it will very soon um, run the risk of, of picking up and discharging current, especially if bad handling habits of the cable during construction have resulted in um, cable insulation damage. Just a little nick is enough. Um, so that's why we need to take care of the isolation values and this is the one where it's non-isolated. So you get some current returning through the earth there and you get some returning through the leakage currents because it's isolated here, but not isolated there. Again, these levels are set by the IEC documents and are not, they don't consider the corrosion risk of the pipe. So what can possibly go wrong? Well, the thresholds that the photovoltaic system operator uses are based on fire risks and the safety of personnel. They, they don't have any concern for corrosion protection of the buried pipe. They probably don't even know it's there. 
So it, it's not a case that the operators are, are lacking in, in diligence. It's just that they don't realize that there is a, a knock-on effect of having poorly insulated systems. The many systems can actually tolerate quite long-term short circuits and leakage, which we would find intolerable from a corrosion point of view. And it's the same, actually, it's not unique to photovoltaic systems. It's the same with the railway system, the London Underground and Overground systems, for example. They have similar earthing configurations to the one I've just shown you. The, you take the Docklands Light Railway, that's a floating earth system. If you take the um, central line, that's um, isolated from earth completely, but it can operate with a, a fault for a, quite a long period of time, days or weeks. So you could get very large currents uh, for weeks from a railway system, for example. So one of the things that the PV operators do is they do care about the isolation resistance and they monitor it. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll do anything about it when it gets bad. And the, the little section we've highlighted here shows how the isolation resistance can vary throughout the day uh, based on uh, the sun and, and the usage of the, the system. So they, wouldn't they might pick it up, but they wouldn't necessarily do anything about it. And here's some actual data, which, which I'm indebted to Professor Haralambos, uh, which these references, you'll be able, to, um, be able to follow these references and read the papers yourself if you're interested. But it, it just shows the relationship between the atmospheric pressure, the relative humidity, and then the, the module temperature, the irradiance from the sun, and the leakage capacitance and the isolation resistance. It, you don't really need to worry too much about these graphs, but it, it just tells the poor old CP guy that his pipeline is going to be subject to, to these kind of interferences. And also, not all, as I mentioned earlier, not all of these solar panels go in deserts and, and areas where it never rains. When it does rain, the isolation resistance between the panel and the framework can drop significantly and you can get quite significant electrical interference currents going into the ground. So we worked out that there are basically three scenarios that you might come across. And the first one is a, a new solar farm being installed above an existing pipeline or close to an existing pipeline. And you've got several phases that you can be concerned about, but the best way by far is always to engage with the contractor and the designer because they can do very simple precautions at the very beginning that will save a lot of time and money later. But I'm looking at this from the point of view of the pipeline operator as we're a pipeline industries guild. And what you need to do before they even put a shovel in the ground is accurately locate the pipe, see what kind of depth it's at, and do a, a CP survey to see what the effective cathodic protection is and if it can take care of a lot of interference. You need to locate where the coating defects are in case you decide to repair them. And you need to see what the overall aggressivity of the, the soil is. And that will help you to design any mitigation you might have to do. And you should also do some data logging of AC and DC potentials before they even build and operate the, the farm, because that allows you to have a baseline and, and say to them, look, this is how it was before you started, and this is what it is now you're operating. It's a good idea to install test posts close to the farm, whether you're crossing or parallel, so that you can do more accurate 
measurements. And we would always recommend repairing the coating. If it's generally in good condition, then which would be indicated by this defect survey here. If it's generally in good condition, then you only need to repair where the defects are. If it's pretty grotty, then you'll have to make a decision whether or not you're going to repair the coating for the affected section or whether you're going to lay um, a linear anode beside the pipe to give cathodic protection all the way along the pipe or even depending on what level of interference you think you might get away with you might put some other kinds of uh, mitigation in there. There are some works that you can do in the office as well. You need to understand how the solar array is going to be laid out and it's a good idea once you've established a liaison with the contractor who's building this and designers to try and get some idea of what their plans are for the next 10 years. Are they expecting to increase the size or increase the, the output in some way? And it's always good to ask them if they could put all the buried cables in plastic conduit. If just that simple act of putting it in plastic conduit will almost eliminate forever any risks of DC interference. Not AC, but we'll come on to that in a minute. You need to establish from the manufacturer what the electrical characteristics are of the entire system so that if necessary, you could get somebody to do some mathematical modeling for you to see what needs to be done in order to protect the, the pipeline. And you need to ask them if you can be involved in seeing the data for the remote monitoring of the isolation resistance because at some stage you might want to consider the graphs of the isolation resistance with the graphs of the electrical interference that you monitor and we certainly recommend that you you put in some remote monitoring of the ac and dc on the pipe and you may even consider some electrical resistance probes which we'll talk about a little bit later which don't rely just on the measurement of the pipe to soil potentials but also measure the actual corrosion rate which is not easy to determine from rapidly fluctuating voltage potentials. The next scenario is existing solar system and a new pipeline. And there, I'm not going to go through all of these things because you can read them, but there you've got a, a much better chance because you can significantly enhance your coating condition in the key area, even if it, say, comes from the factory coated with fusion bonded epoxy with a, an enormous thickness or whatever. It's always a good idea to reinforce that mechanically and, and uh, electrically with. Um, with a, a self amalgamating tape because you'll never get a perfect FBE coating for a 25 year life. Uh, it's, it's, they're quite acceptable if you've got good access to them and you can monitor and maintain them over the years. But when you're talking about these solar farms, there's always a risk that the farm will extend its scope and you may never be able to get back to the pipe to do anything. So it's always good to have belt and braces and to put in extra monitoring and test post facilities. The third situation is if um, you've already got a pipeline and you've already got a PV system, what are you going to do there? Well, some of the steps are the same. The survey works are the same, that's for sure. And then you've got the option with the remedial works to repair the coating defects, install extra CP or adjust the CP and install remote monitoring and erosion probes because in that way you'll be able to see what's going on in perpetuity. So just uh, a second. We now get to the 
what can we do about it stuff. So these are the things that most commonly come up. You need to use a, a tape that is um, suitable for many different kinds of coating. You don't have to select a different tape for different coatings. Um, you need to consider the installation of ER probes, uh, electrical resistance probes, and data loggers. You need to install test posts. You need to improve your CP system, and you need to install remote monitoring. Now, an electrical resistance probe is a, a clever widget. I mentioned to you Ohm's law before. Well, there's another law which says that if you have a piece of metal, say, a, just for, imagine a, a rectangular piece of metal, you can calculate the resistance of that piece of metal if you know the resistivity of the metal, the length of it, and the cross-sectional area. And the cross-sectional area has a major influence on the piece of metal's resistance because the smaller the cross-sectional area, the higher the resistance. So that means that as the piece of metal corrodes, it loses part of its surface and therefore its cross-sectional area changes and its resistance increases. And the electrical resistance probes are very sophisticated devices, entirely suited for rugged use, that measure the, these tiny resistances. They even make compensation for the small temperature changes and so on. And it will tell you what your corrosion rate is. And that allows you to drive your maintenance and monitoring programs so that you can see where you are. Test posts will just help you uh, take the measurements that you need to do. And the remote monitoring will give you a more or less continuous stream of data from the pipe, key data from the pipe, which will allow you to determine whether or not the isolation resistance has dropped in the PV system and you've got increased interference, or hopefully that the cathodic protection is taking care of it. And the cathodic protection can be formulated in such a way that it monitors the interference and automatically changes its output to cope for that interference. And this monitoring system would tell you that, that you're Sorry about the typo there. Install remoting monitoring. Should be install remote monitoring. The, um, it, this will tell you that your system's working okay in terms of voltage and current. This system will tell you whether or not you've got any corrosion, which is the business end of it. The, the tape that we've, uh, that we've talked about here it is, is manufactured by a guild member. And we're not... Um, considering the wide range of tapes that are available, you may find other tapes that, that suit your needs that, that you've used for years and you're happy with. This particular one is very easy to apply and very difficult to apply badly. So that's, that's why we like it. The electrical resistance probes are installed at selected locations on the pipe. If you know, for example, during your survey, you've located, located two coating defects, you can install these retrospectively just by hand augering down this, this probe widget. They're not very big. And that you can put those by the coating defects because the coating defect survey will, act, will locate these with a very high degree of accuracy. And these can be tech connected up to remote monitoring systems as, as well. So you get a continuous reading of what's going on. And this is... Um, the remoting monitoring, remote monitoring. It's, it's just a small device which, which can fit into existing old uh, systems or can be made new. I, I appreciate it's been a very quick trip through all the information that's there, but you, as I mentioned earlier, you will be able to download this 
and, and read this, this document. But there is a research project which is going on and we're very grateful to them for allowing us to share the information of, of the graphs you saw. And if you follow this link, uh, you'll be able to follow them on LinkedIn, but also get all the information there. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge again the courtesy of Elgin Energy letting us uh, use the images that they provided of the solar farm. The information on the butylene tape came from Decotech, which you can, um, they're guild members, you can click on those. The remote monitoring we showed you came from Vilekas. The corrosion probes came from Metricor. If you go onto their websites, it will inspire you to look at other websites and see what other devices are available or, or compatible. This presentation is a presentation on behalf of the onshore panel. The chairman is Sean Greenwood and I think he'll be uh, listening today. If you wanted uh, any further information on the onshore panel and how that can help you, um, then please contact Sean. And if you've got any specific information that you want from the Guild, you can go to their website. There's a lot of information on there and you'll get a link to the YouTube channel that uh, it has. And it, indeed, if you had um, a topic or you wanted more information on this topic, if you contacted the Guild, they would be able to assist you. So thanks for sitting through rather a long presentation. It, it's a new topic. It's one that's uh, dealt with for the very, very first time in uh, an international standard, the ISO standard, which um, is being written at this moment. Let me just uh, show you. We've put an annex in the new standard. This standard is just uh, at the moment with ISO going through its final editing, but there's plenty of inf informative information in the ISO standard which tells you all about these, these issues and, and gives you ideas about how to deal with it. So uh, again, we'd like to uh, express our thanks to Professor Khair Lambus for the technical contributions and from Dr. Luffler for the coatings information. I rather foolishly said the mistakes are the responsibility of the authors, but actually they're the responsibility of Richard Lindley, not me. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I, uh, I'll see if there's any information on the chat with regard to questions, but if anybody wants to um, raise a question, uh, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and um, we'll do our best to answer them. Thanks very much. Were there any questions on the chat, uh, Catherine? Um, there are. There are some questions, but there seems to be some people answering the questions, <laughs> other people. So um, oh, right. let me just see. Uh, so Tony Voss has asked, do these stray PV system currents enter the pipeline via induction, but leave via conduction and cause the problem? Well, that's a very good question. The, um, the direct currents are entirely conductive. If there is an overhead power line also crossing your pipeline, those voltages would be induced into the pipe, but they would leave via a conductive path through the soil. So DC is conductive in this sense, and the AC is inductive when it gets on and conductive when it leaves. But I have to say that the Corrosion rates from AC uh, will be quite different. It doesn't follow the 9.1 kilo per amp per year uh, in, in quite the same way, but AC is quite a different um, problem to deal with. Um, the next one is from George. I'm not sure who he's working for. Uh, is there still a risk of pipeline corrosion if the cable is brought above ground and a span over of overhead conductor put across the pipeline? No, so, so long as the, the isolation resistance from the cables is not 
in contact with the electrolyte, the soil, then there won't be any leakage current from it. But if the, um, the solar panels themselves are on a metal frame, which is connected to a metal leg, which goes into the ground, so that wouldn't disappear. And if the overhead cable was on a metal cable tray and there was leakage into the cable tray from, from the damage to the insulation and the cable tray is connected to the earth, then that, that might also contribute to the problem. Um, let me just check this. I can, I can have a look through this. Yeah, there's, there's a, someone's asked a question. There seems to be a few people that have then sent answers. I see I'm really doing myself out of a job here because uh, Mike says he now understands CP. <laughs> which means we won't get any work from him then. I shall have to uh, change it. Uh, there's a message, uh, a message from uh, Scott McLeod. Um, uh, contact Luke Perret. Oh yeah, Luke. Luke is uh, available. Is always um, willing to give information and assistance. Um, I should uh, do I have any advice in terms of the guideline just there's one from Richard Broom um, which uh, came through to me and it's in terms of any advice in terms of guideline distance that the pipeline operators gosh that you could only really work that out Richard by modeling and calculation the the modeling of these the interference risks from these systems has pretty much been perfected by Professor Jaralambos. Um, you don't always need to do finite element analysis. You can do some simple maths yourself from um, existing CP works. I, I guess I, I've worked on the principle that it wouldn't be possible to move either the pipe or the farm. So I, I, I'm afraid I didn't consider that I could um, if you leave your email address with, um, with the Guild, I can give you some guidelines on what we've done for AC distances in various standards and what we've done for high DC currents. But I'm not sure that the high DC currents would be valid without checking the maths. So, I'll have to come back to you on that, Richard. I, I guess the answer would be as far as possible, but that's, that's a bit trite, really. Uh, there was another not... message from Nick. How much current may pass along a lead jointed CI pipe? Right. Well, cast iron pipes and ductile iron pipes are actually better off than many because of the inherent insulation that you get at the spigot and socket joints. So I've only considered in this a continuous steel pipe. The risk is significantly less for uh, cast iron and ductile iron, even though they're generally very poorly coated and hardly ever cathodically protected. They, they don't have such a risk because the extent of them is so short electrically. Yes, as somebody, um, somebody pointed out, um, Philip pointed out that ductile line would have to be bonded at all of the joints in order for the CP to work or every joint would have to have its own CP. Oh, excuse me. Um, we can download these, this chat with the questions. So um, if we wanted to round up now, I can always forward the questions on to you, Ken, and then um, you could reply uh, to any okay. others unless you want to continue. No, I'm, I'm happy if there are, anybody wants to activate their mic. No. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I hope you found it of some use. Uh, I can, 
I highly recommend um, keeping your eye on ISO for the publication of the standard 21857 if you've got these problems. And it's always good to engage with the constructions team early on so that you can just at the very simplest get them to put the cables in, in a plastic pipe because if you look at the added cost to the actual installation it, it's peanuts to put them in plastic and it, and it serves, um, serves us very well. So thanks a lot everybody. Thank you, Ken. Um, like I say, this is being recorded, so it will be on the YouTube channel for anyone that missed out or wants to refresh themselves. So uh, look on the Guild website for all of our upcoming webinars. We've got something on every week now until the end of July. So, And if you're interested in presenting a webinar, get in touch with Kate at Guild HQ on the events email address. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.